welcome to the Egalitarian Connection, your connection to Christians of Biblical Equality, Archaeology, and the Persecuted Church. In this session of the Women of the Bible, Richard Krager will be taking us through chapters 1 to 3 of the book of Genesis. Here he will be explaining to us the unique creation of man and woman made in the image of God. Richard will show us how this relationship that was called good by God became distorted. Listen to what God said about the creation of man and woman and all creation. In Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he made and it was very good. It was after Satan caused Adam and Eve to sin that their relationship became distorted and not good again. Jesus Christ was sent to restore this relationship 4,000 years later and is still restoring it today in his priesthood of all believers. Now watch, let's watch this session of our video with Richard Krager. Our Father, we come to you. We ask that the Holy Spirit will be able to get our teacher. We come again to your word. Open thou thy word and show us marvelous things out of thy law that we may live by it and obey it and be filled with the love of Christ our Savior. So we pray in his name. Amen. Well, I kept promising you my better half was going to come and was going to take on the Genesis material. So at long last, here he is. We finally got here safely uh, on Saturday. Uh, he ended up in the hospital and I had to drive back. I came and taught the class last week and left very early. Uh, Thursday morning, and my husband is back, and here he is, right side up, and on deck to do the Genesis material. My husband's in. Well, we're going to find out in Genesis 2 the two better halves make one better whole. <coughs> Can anybody see this? I'm very sorry that we have to start at the beginning in the middle. But every year in January, I have to go to Gordon Conwell. Con Conwell joined Gordon, and they now have a Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary for two weeks to study in my doctor of ministry program. And so I'm always late for these classes that we have in Minnesota. And she always has to start something else before we get to Genesis. So we apologize for that. But tonight, we'll go back to the beginning and maybe do some reviewing. Um, I don't know what Kathy said in the introductory session, but I always say, you don't have to agree with anything we say. We just agree we're not going to fight over this very controversial study and subject. <coughs> We've found that generally works very well because then the Holy Spirit can be the arbiter. We also say that the Bible is set in a very androcentric world. Androcentric comes from the Greek word for male, which is on air, andros, and centric is just center, centered, a very male-centered world, sometimes called patriarchal, both in the ancient Near Eastern world and in the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament times, and among the Jews, there's a very strong tendency in most cultures, not all, but most, to be male-dominated domi and Therefore, the Bible, I believe, reflects male domination and androcentricity, but doesn't necessarily espouse it, if you can get the difference or the distinction. It certainly shows up in the Bible. Some of the law codes are simply basically copies of, or very similar to other ancient Near Eastern codes that have show, as Kathy probably showed you in the Old Testament section, some of the double standard business, whereas a husband could divorce his wife for anything, called an indecency, the wife couldn't divorce the husband at all. He could be a tremendous adulterer, but he was never guilty of adultery. Only the wife was. Well, by the time Jesus came, things were much more balanced, and Jesus did a lot to uh, set the record straight. It was an androcentric, patriarchal world, but that doesn't mean that the Bible writers or the Lord who wrote the Bible, or inspired the Bible, meant this world to be patriarchal. We will see tonight, I think, where this comes from, as far as the Bible is concerned. <coughs> We're going to go to Genesis 1. If you have your Bibles, you could be turning to that. Let me just say, too, by way of prolegomena, 
that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are some of the greatest of all writing, and yet some of the most difficult to deal with, <coughs> because those writers didn't write history the way we do today. No one gives any dates in the first 11 chapters, or anywhere in Genesis for that matter. No one uh, tells you the names of kings and so forth and so on. The liberals would like to call it myth and legend and saga and all the rest, and, and it can't be that because it's definitely historical, and yet it's not written the way we write science or history today. I suppose in some ways you could call it pre-scientific, and certainly not unscientific. It just was never meant to be scientific. I conclude once the editor of the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology that Baker put out in a more recent year asked me to do an article on legend. The forum critics, if you've ever heard of them, and if you haven't, we won't worry about them too much, have all these little ways of looking at parables, for example, or proverb, or the various kinds of forms of literature in the Bible, one of which is legend, another of which is myth and saga. And I w they say that the patriarchal narratives in Genesis, beginning in Genesis 12, are legend, and that, to most people, means they aren't real. Archaeology has proven that those strange goings-on among the patriarchs and adopting people to be your heir and, and having a concubine who gives you a baby and she, he becomes the heir and, and all these strange things are exactly like Amorite culture and in the times and <laughs> Aramean culture around Haran, to which Abraham and his family came. And uh, so these are not unhistorical, these are real stories. The first 11 chapters I have concluded are really written about great, very, very complex events of creation and history, but they're written like stories that you would tell to a child. And therefore, they are eternally valid and eternally readable fortunately for us, because if they had been written scientifically or historically the way we think it should be written today, no one would have read them for 2,000 years, or 4,000 years, I guess you should say, at least. But these are timeless because they are written to be stories which are theological and poetic. I just put a brief outline of chapter one on the board that Old Testament scholars have concocted, and maybe you've seen this before. Uh, my friend Ron Youngblood, that used to teach at Bethel Seminary for many years, showed me this first. Of course, we have the greatest statement of anything ever said in the first verse of Genesis, and everything else in life and history has to be interpreted in the light of, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then, of course, in the second verse, they throw everything under the sun, the dinosaurs and everything else, it simply says, the earth was without form and void. The earth was formless and it was empty. It wasn't really an earth, but the universe, we would say today, was formless and it was empty. Very nice in Hebrew because the words rhyme. Formlessness is tohu and emptiness is bohu. So Kathy's always saying, you do the tohu and the bohu for us in this course. Well. We're interested in the second verse where there was matter. God had created matter, I guess, by his word out of nothing, but it was not formed. Well, we have these creative days, and people like to argue about whether they were 24-hour days or not. And, of course, I don't think they're necessarily 24-hour days. I always thought it was more spiritual if they were more like 24 million years or if they were more like 24 split seconds. But 24-hour days somehow doesn't sound all that spiritual to me. Of course, they don't have to be because the word yom in Hebrew means many things. For example, in the fourth verse of chapter 2, we definitely have the use of the word day, which doesn't mean 24 hours because it says, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no plant was in the field and so and so and so and so. Well, that day obviously has to be at least seven days or six days and not a 24-hour day. So it doesn't really matter how long it took. God doesn't tell us, and not, neither does he tell us how he did it. I had a great professor of theology in seminary. I thought probably the greatest evangelical theologian of our century, Edward John Carnell, at least one of them. Maybe those who went to Westminster would say Van Til was his equal. 
I guess Van Til may have been his teacher, but Ed Carnell used to say, probably God used lots of different ways. He used creation, fiat creation, but he also used evolution, which simply means change. As long as we're not talking about natural evolution just by chance, we're not talking about evolutionism, we're just talking about natural selection and processes that God used. I always say this because I'm a bird fancier, that on this side of the Rocky Mountains there are yellow shafted flickers, if you know what a flicker is, kind of a woodpecker, and underneath his wings are yellow, but on the other side of the Rockies, same bird has orange shafts, and uh, did God have to make two different flickers, or did he just make birds and let a lot of processes take care of all this? Well, we don't know, but it isn't necessary. Every time you start asking these dumb questions like, how did God do things, and where did Cain get his wife and all this? You ruin the story, so we won't do that. Now. At any rate, God created on the first day a great mass of matter called light. And then people always ask, well, how could it be light when there are no lights? Well, could be God's Shekinah glory. God did it, and uh, we don't have to worry about that. But we see this beautiful parallelism that on the fourth day, we have the creation of things to fill up this problem of emptiness with things, we have the creation of the lights, the sun and the moon, which is called the light, and the stars. On the second day, we have this firmament, which is divided waters above the earth and waters on the earth. And on the fifth day, we have water creatures. The thing that always interested me was that the fifth day says birds are also created. And of course, modern biological science says birds evolved from reptiles and from fish and so forth. Someone recently showed me this and said, well, you have water and you have sky here on the second day. But I wonder, is sky really a form of matter or is it just an emptiness? Anyway, then he said, that's why we have sky, sky beasts, creations over here, birds and things that fly. Well, that might be too. Then we have on the third day, the creation of the earth. I saw a little bit of translation, transition here because it says, on this day, some vegetation appeared, sort of carries you over to the other side. Then, of course, on day six, we have earth creatures. We've got this fantastic structure, which is beautiful and literary, which shows us that we don't have to worry about the science here. We can leave that up to God. And let, let's not ruin the story by asking all kinds of scientific questions, which God didn't care to give us answers to. Day six is the one that interests us most. And it was the longest, evidently, because on this day also, man was created. As we'll immediately then turn to verse 24, where we have the creation of earth creatures, animals and other creatures, and man. Of course, we have day seven in which God rested, and that becomes the basis for the Sabbath, which we all need. Since I had open heart surgery last summer, I realized that I need a Sabbath every afternoon. And so I wonder how God can go so long without a rest. God said, let us bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, verse 24, according to their kinds, and it was so. In other words, God called these things into being by the word of his power. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the cattle according to their kinds and everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. One other thing I'd like to say is really we're, we're talking about a study of human sexuality when we talk about the roles in, in the Bible of men and women. Today, a lot of people make the mistake of using the word sexuality when they really mean sex and intercourse. And really, sexuality is a word that's a, an umbrella word that covers all of man's sexual distinctive as male and female. And so let's not use that word when we really are talking about sex in terms of sexual intercourse. Let's use it right. But I find this in writing. I find this in people's speech that they're always using the word sexuality. And what they're talking about is sexual intercourse. That's just a little added bonus. <laughs> We're talking about human sexuality beginning to be formed here. And my main point is to ask you whether or not you see inequality or superiority in any of these verses between the man and the woman or the male and the female. 
Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, this man is obviously generic man. It is Adam, Adam in Hebrew, which can mean earth, and it also then becomes the word to describe man as man, man as generic man, not male or female yet, but just mankind. And therefore, there's some continuity with the original uh, creation here because man, too, is said to be formed of earth just as the animals were. But immediately in this 26th verse, we have discontinuity, where it says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The image of God, the imago dei, comes in for its first mention in the Bible, and scholars are still arguing over what that means. I just took a course at Gordon-Conwell, the theology course I had to take on humanity and all of its aspects, and one of the things that we read about a lot, in fact, whole books were on the image of God in man. And uh, Karl Barth said the image of God in man is, according to these verses, is male and female. And the famous writer that some of you know, Philip Edgecombe Hughes, the British, Christian British philosopher and theologian, said the image of God in man is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the image of God as the son of man, as the man. And I think they're probably both right. I think somehow if theologians worked at it, they could harmonize these two views. At any rate, this word is not talking about the male as such. Now, I have a pet theory, which no one ever seems to agree with me here, but there isn't any real sense of talking about maleness until you have femaleness, because maleness doesn't mean anything. And it isn't even mentioned until later on here. We know that this is humankind. Martin Luther used the word menschen in his German translation. We know that this is mankind in general because of the parallels in the rest of the verse, the next two verses. Now, the hour, God is speaking in some kind of plurality. Some say that doesn't necessarily relate to the Trinity. Let us make man in our image doesn't necessarily relate to a Trinitarian view, but it may. Some say it's a, it is a plural. The name God here is a plural. Elohim, that's a Hebrew plural. Anything with a long I, M is a plural, which means that God is not limited. God is unlimited and so forth and so on. And some people call this a plural of majesty. And so our may relate to just the greatness, the vastness, the total unlimitedness of God and his nature and all his being. Or God may be talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit here. I took a course last summer at Gordon-Conwell, a New Testament course with Royce Greenler, who's written a great book on the Trinity as a family, which goes a long way to shoot down these heretical views that are used to interpret this chapter in which there's a subordination in the Trinity due to 1 Corinthians 11 and other places, which I'm sure Paul didn't mean what people read into it. But there's no subordination in the Trinity. They are equally God, and they're equal in every way. And uh, if there's any kind of discrimination between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it has to do with their roles. And long, long, long ago in the history of the church, way back in the earliest centuries, the heresy of... Uh, what? Subordination. Subordinate, well hierarchical trinity was shot down, we thought. But it's always rearing its ugly head, particularly when people have a chance to say, therefore, if God is, has a hierarchy, then certainly man does, and woman is on the lowest rung. Well, we'll come to that later. Let them have dominion. We have a plural here. All these words in Hebrew are masculine, simply because the word Adam, earth, and which became also man, is a masculine noun in Hebrew. Let them have dominion indicates that there is a plurality in mankind here, too. And it's parallel to man in the first part of this verse. Let us make man and let them have dominion means man. Well, man is plural here. So it isn't just talking about the male of the species. Let them have dominion over everything, over the cattle, the earth, and every creeping thing. And so God created man, again, mankind in his image. 
in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All of these pronouns are synonymous. They're parallel to one another. Whether they're singular or plural in English, they all relate to the same thing, the creation of mankind as male and female. The image of God in man is male and female. If you turn to the first two verses of chapter 5, you'll see this stated even more clearly. We'll do that a little later. But God says, let them have dominion. We could spend a whole week talking about the image of God in man, what it is. It doesn't mean that God looks like a man. If God has arms and hands and feet and a mouth and a voice and so forth, he also has feathers according to the psalmist. So if you want to be literal and say that God, like the Mormons do, is a great big giant of a human being, then you're in trouble, I think, because Jesus said God is spirit. And therefore, if we're going to really worship him in spirit and in truth, we can't turn him into a look-alike look or a human being. Our likeness to God is internal, whatever it is. Probably it's although there are many modern theologians beginning to argue that even our bodies reflect the glory of God in their created state. But God doesn't look like us. and We don't look like God. God is spirit. We talk about God as having arms and hands and legs and mouth because we can't understand spirit. This is called, of course, anthropomorphic language. Well, this goes on then to talk about why God created man in his own image. Certainly God consciousness, the ability to think, the ability to abstract, to think abstractly, to, to reason, and so forth and so on, things that we don't think animals have are all part of the image of God. But certainly the most important aspect is our ability to be conscious of God's presence, God's working in our life and understand his voice when he speaks to us. That's all part of the image, whatever it is. And so God created man in his own image, verse 27, which for many is the key verse concerning human sexuality, these two verses in the whole Bible. He created man in his image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, verse 28, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Here is a double-edged mandate. Obviously the first part of the mandate could not be fulfilled by the man alone, the male alone. You can't fill the earth with children with just one half of this human creation, either half. God did not create the Greek idea of hermaphrodite or whatever, two sexes in one person. That's not what we have here, or the crazy ideas that some of the ancient Near Eastern people have that you have this God who split in half like a shellfish, and half is male and half is female, and that's when the separation came. We don't have any of that here. Uh, we don't have any of this stuff here about that the other ancient Near Eastern peoples had about God having sexuality, and God creating by uh, reproducing himself through the sex act. You have none of that, although that's just typical of all these very human-like gods of the ancient Near Eastern peoples. Here, God is no part of that. But man has not only distinctive sexuality, but man has to cooperate with woman in order to fulfill the first half of this mandate. But I suggest to you that it also takes both of them to fill the second half of the mandate, that is to have dominion over the earth and subdue it. Man was supposed to be the steward of the earth. We now notice that man has messed up on both sides of this mandate. He's overpopulated and he's under-stewarded, he under-ecologized, if you want to say. And so the world is a mess because of sin. But man and woman together, male and female together, created in God's image, are given this double mandate and they have to, they have to work at the task of fulfilling God's requests here together. You can't do it alone, that's very important. There's absolutely no sign here of any kind of insubordination and inferiority or subordinate role for the female is over against the male. Uh, most people agree that Genesis 1 teaches nothing of inequality or subordination. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and so forth and so on. Have dominion over everything. And then he said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed 
for food and so forth, and even uh, eventually some forms of animal life for food. And God provides everything that man needs. In verse 31, God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't see any inequality between the male or the female at all here. Well, lots of people say, well, it's not the first chapter. We're, we're sure that the first chapter teaches equality and the, and the sameness of the sexes. That is, that they're both created equally in the image of God and both have the double mandate to, to fulfill, but it's the second chapter that's the problem. The second chapter is said by not only Elizabeth Cady Stanton, that formidable feminist, but many others, the second chapter is said to contradict the first, and here's where the trouble starts. Well, I don't believe that either. By the way, I don't know if you know about the women of Seneca Falls, but many, many of them became Christians in the great revivals under Charles G. Finney and others of the Second Great Awakening. And out of that Second Great Awakening, as with the first Jonathan Edwards' time, all kinds of social concerns arose. In, in terms of the Second Great Awakening, of course, there was the great work for the emancipation of the slaves and women. But it got to be such a great benevolence empire with all these different associations for social amelioration that by the time Charles D. Finney had his greatest revival in Rochester, New York in about 1854, there were societies created just to pray for the other societies. They were so concerned for changing the world. And that's true, they were. There were all kinds of new societies grew up all over the, well, the eastern half of the world was, of the country was mostly what there was of America in those days. And uh, it is called the Benevolence Empire, and it grew out of true spiritual awakening. Elizabeth Cady Stent was converted in one of Charles G. Finney's meetings somewhere around Albany or Utica or Rome or someplace in that part of the world where we had our last pastorate. But she said the second chapter is wrong and she uh, sort of masterminded the women's Bible that like the Jefferson Bible left out everything she didn't like. Well, we don't do that here. <laughs> we believe that it's all God's word. You know that not everything in the Bible is true because you have the word, words of false prophets and you have the words of the devil and you have all kinds of words that aren't truth but they're still the word of God and that he inspired them to be here and put them here. Well, let's look at the second day uh, or the second chapter, I mean, after this word about the Sabbath in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, then God creates the man. Of course, you all, if you go to a non-Christian college, know how deeply entrenched the whole idea of the theory of evolution is. Well, what is called the documentary hypothesis about written sources of the Old Testament, particularly Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, is also so deeply entrenched that most, at least the liberal theological seminaries and colleges, don't know any different. And this idea began right here in that the name for God in the first chapter is one name and the name for God in the second chapter is another name. So they said these two chapters had to come from different sources, written sources originally in Moses or else. Of course, they really think these are written, put down in writing much later, sometimes as late as the time of Ezra, which means you mess up your whole Old Testament theology and everything else. They say that these two chapters are also contradictory because they come from different sources. Well, if you know Shakespeare, if you've grown up with him at all, you know he has lots of different kinds of writing. And he isn't just stuck with one milieu or one mode of writing. And so Moses and his school of scribes could have had a lot of different things and brought different oral traditions in, but essentially they have written this and it makes a great story and it all hangs together instead of contradicting each other. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 are complementary. Now there's a, a structural relationship in Genesis, part of the structure, both historical and biographical and everything else ideological, which goes from the large end of the megaphone uh, to the small end of the megaphone and starts with generic man, Adam. 
But when it gets down here, it comes to a particular man named Abraham. And if you'll notice, you move from the general to the particular throughout this whole movement of these structural relations, and the biography and the geography. It all keeps narrowing down. First you have three sons of Adam, and you're only interested in Seth. And then you go on through the line of Seth, and you come to three sons of Noah, and you're only interested in Shem, really, although the others, their genealogies are mentioned. But then you go on down, finally, to this man, Abraham, who is the first Hebrew. Well, that relationship of moving from the general to the particular is the same structural relationship you have here between chapters 1 and 2. In the first chapter, we have a picture of the generic creation without any detail, particularly the generic creation, the general creation of man. But in the second chapter, you have a much more particular story of, of the creation of man and woman and what happens to them. And I don't see any contradiction here. I think they complement one another. Well, we'll look at chapter 2 then. We're really going to skip on fast because we really have to cover quite a bit of ground here so we can't look at every verse. Actually, people have gotten all shaken by the fact that when, verse 5, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, no herb of the field sprung up, for the Lord God had caused, not caused it to rain, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up, and so then the Lord God formed man of the dust. Again, a continuity with the animal creation and previous creation. But also, again, the dust from the ground. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Here, again, is the discontinuity. This is another way of talking about the image of God. It doesn't mean that Adam and Eve were, well, Adam was just a tire. This is just not a problem of pneumatic principle in which you just put air in a bladder and blow it up. Or whatever you would do with it. However, you could blow up a bunch of clay and turn it into a balloon for the Macy's Day Parade that looks like a man. This really, this breath of life is also the spirit of God. You probably all know that the Hebrew word and the Greek word for spirit mean the same as breath, wind. Both he Hebrew word ruach and the Greek word nauma can be breath and they can be spirit and here they're both. Really? <laughs> yeah, I like to talk about the male man. Well, <laughs> it's possible in Hebrew to have ha adam, the article and the noun, and still mean just not a particular man. So sometimes in my translation, which is the RSV, you'll have one way and sometimes the other, and it can both mean the generic man. But by the time you get to verse 7, uh, Let's see, where is it actually here? The Lord God formed the man from the dust. See, my translation has the Lord, verse 7, then the Lord God formed man of dust, and man became a living being. That again can be generic. But then when it says in the 8th verse, he put the man whom he'd formed in Eden, that probably is the particular man. I still don't know that maleness means anything here until you get femaleness. But anyway, you can see the particular man in, in verse 7 if you want to, because I guess only one was created. But it really is generic man in the same sense that he represents the whole human race. When Paul wants to talk about who really sinned, he talks about Adam. But what he's really talking about is Adam and Eve together sin. The generic parents really represent the human race as male and female created as mankind, and therefore I don't think that Paul is necessarily limiting this guilt just to the first man, Adam, as we think of Adam, but the first man representative of the whole human race. So what, this is probably the individual man, but he's also still the representative man, and he remains that until Jesus comes and, and takes over as the true representative to do away with what the first representative did, undid, I guess you'd say, in the fall. So it's a little hard because the Hebrew article is, is with Adam in these places, and yet it doesn't always necessarily mean a particular man.
really isn't all that important until uh, the, the woman comes along and we begin to get, or God comes and starts speaking to him, we begin to get some relation. Well, God planted the garden and so forth, and he, he made the trees to grow and gave the man who was there to till the garden to be able to eat anything he wanted except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't say it's an apple tree. It could have been any kind of a token test of his obedience. God could have said, don't go 25 miles an hour along this road or don't jump this brook from east to west or whatever. But God said, don't eat of this particular tree. No doubt there are other trees in the garden of the same kind of fruit. And so Adam really wasn't going to miss anything if he avoided this particular fruit. Again, we have to think of it as a child's story, having timeless meaning and not try to understand every detail here as though it was an allegory or something. But this tree, all the trees were very pleasant and good for food and so forth. Then there is the river flowing here and the location of Eden is somewhere evidently in the Mesopotamian region, although it talks about the river of Egypt and it talks about Tigris and Euphrates. And so it isn't any particular location that we can really pin down very closely. The river of Egypt, by the way, is not the Nile. You read about the river of Egypt in the Old Testament. It's a big, dried-up riverbed in the middle of Sinai that was the river of Egypt, actually. But that really isn't all that far from the Nile, so it doesn't matter much. At any rate, in verse 15, we're beginning to get interested in this this part of the chapter. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to keep, till it and keep it. He's supposed to be starting to be the steward here, but there's something's lacking. He can't really do the job very well because all he can do is talk to himself. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. That's grace as far as I'm concerned, total grace. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you should not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. What's important is that the woman isn't here yet. <laughs> now, I think verse 18 is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible, but I also think it's one of the most important verses of theology ever written about the human race. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Everything else up to this point has been called good. The whole creation as God made it is called good. All of a sudden, here's something that's not good. This man, this individual, male, if you want to call him a male, this representative of the race that isn't yet, is not complete. There's something wrong here. He needs someone to be a companion. He needs someone to be his, in his likeness. And God does a very strange thing. Instead of creating the woman right away, God runs the whole animal creation before him. Maybe it wasn't quite as complicated and large as it is now, but God runs all these beasts before this man, and, and he gives them names. God, so out of the ground, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Now, there are, there's this book by Mary Evans, a very fine English New Testament scholar. If you don't know her book on woman in the Bible, it's a very good one. I think University Press put it out. There are four main arguments, she says, used to show that Genesis 2 teaches subordination of the woman to the man, thus his dominion over her as a creation ordinance. First, woman was created after the man and is therefore secondary to him. We'll come to that. Woman is taken from the man and is therefore secondary to him. We'll come to that. Woman is named by the man and is therefore subordinate to him. Or woman is created to be a helper for the man and as such is subordinate to him. I'm interested in the third one at the moment. As you all, I'm sure, have heard many times, naming in the ancient world was considered to be a function of one who is in authority. And in the naming of something, you have to understand that being. The name in the ancient world meant and stood for all the characteristics and all the life of that being, so that the names of God are very, very important, and that's why we don't take them in vain. We don't take the name of God lightly because 
It's not just a label like our names. Like my name means fat bartender and I'm a skinny preacher. <laughs> it doesn't really mean a thing. In German, my name, Dick Krager, means a fat tavern keeper. And really, I've never been a fat ta tavern keeper. Yeah, that's a good point. However, it's even more so in the ancient world because the name, like, when you have a name change, such as Avram to Abraham, you have a conversion. When you have a name change from Jacob, who's a schemer and a conniver, to Israel, a prince with God, you have a conversion. The whole character of the being is represented in this name. It's not just a mere label by which we recognize one another. As Did God create the language? Adam or did Adam create his own language? Well, that again is... Yeah. Well, I guess just the idea that if Adam spoke the first, I mean, was given the freedom to make his own language, that would explain some of the androcentric nature of language itself. Well, it might. I don't know because Adam really doesn't have any reason to be androcentric since there isn't anything else. He, he's it. <laughs> well, at any, we can only go, it's all, as I say, when you begin to ask questions like this, then you have to speculate, and it, you can, you know, your, your idea is as good as mine. However, God did a strange thing. Instead of bringing the woman to him immediately, he runs the whole creation of animal, and bird, and so forth by him, and Adam gave names to all the cattle. One thing we want to notice here is that the Hebrew, uh, oh dear, what would you call it? The Hebrew formula for naming is Korah Shem. To call, Korah is the verb, to call a name. Now, here we have that, but in the verse that many people take to indicate that man, that the male named the woman, Verse 23, that naming formula is not there. It says she shall be called woman because she's taken out of man. Just hold that in the back of your mind. The naming formula is, formula is here when Adam names the animals, but it's not there when he do, it doesn't name Eve. Really, he calls her woman. That's a, that's a classification and not a name. But a lot of people say that's where he exercised authority and dominion over her and giving her her name. Actually, he doesn't give her her name until after the fall, which may have something to do with that kind of dominion as part of sin and not part of the original creation. At any rate, I think that naming is not the important element here in this whole little episode of the animals passing in review. By the way, this reminded me of, of one of Gary Larson's far side jokes in which he had Noah standing up on the rail of the ark, looking down on all the animals who were there two by two. And he said, we're going to do this alphabetically. And the zebra said, blankety blank, blank, blank. The zebra said, damn. Well, I once said that in a lesson like this, and a, a lady got up and walked out. So I decided I better not say it anymore. But this is kind of the feeling I have for Adam, you know. That all these animals are passing in review, and he's giving them names. He's lining them up. And the result of all this is that there was no creature, no helper fit for him. Ah, here it is, verse 20. There, here's the trouble, said Elizabeth Cady Stanton and millions of other people. A helper fit for him. This, of course, according to the, these various theories, woman is created to be a helper for man and as such is subordinate to him. Well, here's where the trouble starts, and here's where chapter 2 contradicts chapter 1 and all this sort of thing. Well, I'm not so sure that's true. A helper fit for him is really literally something more like a help of his like. You've probably heard this many times if you've been reading this literature. The word help is etzer. Eben etzer, Ebenezer, is a compound of this particular noun, helper. Uh, a rock, my helper. Uh, God as my helper is a rock, Ebenezer. Here, the word etzer occurs about 20 
or 25 times in the Old Testament, and all but five, all but four of them, five, four of them are used of God as a helper. And we know Psalm 121, which puts it in question form. My help, I lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence does my help come, the RSV says. The answer is my help comes from the Lord. God is my helper. There are three uses, mostly in the prophets, I think one in Daniel, one in Ezekiel, and one in Isaiah, where they talk about human helpers who aren't very helpful. But the only other place this is used of a human being is here. Therefore, the word in its predominance, it just overwhelmingly is not pejorative in the Old Testament. It's God as a helper. It doesn't have anything to do with a, an inferior being as a helper. And therefore, to say that the woman who's going to be created is inferior because she's called a helper, and that means she's supposed to be a maidservant and darn his socks and wait on him hand and foot and all this, that just isn't there in that particular word. Plus, the other part of this double-edged uh, designation is kenegdo, a help of his like. Uh, let me find this word by... Do any of you know Joy Fleming? She lives in this area. Joy did her doctoral work in Germany on these chapters. And she has something in her enormous dissertation that I had never really seen before until I began to get into it. And I had it written in one of these margins, which of course I can't find. But um, here it is. She points out that the root meaning of kenegdo is literally in front of. Well, it means conspicuous, it means other things. But its basic root meaning is that this being confronts him when she's finally created. She's over against him. She's not behind him. She's not at his side where he can't see her. She is opposite him. And so she says, Literally what happens is when he looks at her, he will be seeing himself. Now at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And that's very, very good to notice. That it's face to face, not one above the other. Or, and maybe this is why she was created out of his side. There's always been these funny arguments about she wasn't created out of his head to lord it over him, nor was she created out of his feet to be tramped on. But she was taken from his side to be an equal, to be his counterpart, to complete him, to be the help of his like. And I think this is very important. There's no inferiority in these two words that go together to be called the, the helper, that is translated usually helper fit for him. So God decides, well, now all these animals have gone by, and there's no helper fit for him. I suggest to you that naming is not the important dynamic here, but recognition is. We're not worried about naming and showing that he is the dominant being. We're, we're interested in the fact that he recognizes that in all of this creation, there is no help of his like. He is still unsatisfied. There is no one here who really understands him, who can talk his language. And so, I have a pet theory, which I always say at this point. I've never heard anybody else say it. But it seems to me if you believe in orders of creation at all, here is where God outlaws bestiality. Because no beast is found to be, and of course, the sexual union is far more than just a physical thing. No beast is found to be the help of his like. But it also outlaws, in a sense, homosexuality, in that God does not create another male satisfy the need he creates the female now you can take it or leave it I don't say it too loudly because it probably stir up more hornets nests than it's worth but anyway here's a very basic fundamental place in the story of creation which is the basis of all our understanding of life that probably has this kind of dynamic in it at any rate Finally, when this is all over, a man recognizes that there's nothing here that will satisfy the need. God causes this great cosmic surgical operation to take place, and he puts the man to sleep. It says, literally in the Hebrew, into a deep sleep, so that the man, the male, 
has absolutely nothing to do with what goes on. It's totally beyond his control. He has nothing to say about it. Maybe he sputtered and, and yelled at God, saying, Lord, I, I still don't see anything here that is going to do anything about my loneliness. Um, and so God puts him to sleep. And when he's asleep, he, he takes one of his ribs and out of the... Uh, the rib which he's taken from the man he makes into a woman and brought her to the man. When the man wakes up and sees her, he says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh in my flesh. I've never seen it in print before, but I think you have a couple of Hebrew superlatives here. The Hebrew, you know, we have good, better, best, and better is the comparative, and best is a superlative. The way the Hebrews do this is to say, God of gods, Lord of lords, very God of very God, King of kings, that means the highest Lord, the highest King, the umpteenth, the best. Well, here is bone of bone and flesh of flesh. He's absolutely what I need. There doesn't need to be any more search. The help of his light is standing right in front of him. And so he says, she be, she'll be called woman because she's taken out of man. There's a play on words here. The Hebrews love punning and Playing on words, the Hebrew word for man is ish, and the Hebrew word for woman is isha, showing that even in the etymology, entomology, etymology, there's this understanding of their relatedness. And so man and woman in English uh, have the same emphasis on their relatedness. Now, once in Hinckley, Minnesota, I preached a sermon on these two chapters. And the whole roof of the church fell in on me. And people were going around yelling and screaming. One man said, I wanted to get up and walk out of church, but I didn't dare. I said, well, why didn't you? What kind of courage is that? But the women were the ones who were most shaken. They can't operate down in the basement making the supper anymore. They have to be up here on the same level with their husbands, and they don't want to be on the level. They don't want to be equal with men. Well, finally... It seemed to be that they were most worried about marriage. And I said, we haven't even talked about marriage yet. That doesn't come until verse 24. And uh, here's the first mention of marriage. All we're talking about is the creation of mankind as male and female. And up to this point, I don't know what you see, but I just don't see any inequality. Chapter 2 simply complements chapter 1 by giving us a more detailed picture of the creation of the woman and the man. And they still are both responsible for the double-edged mandate up to this point. Now, we have a very interesting first look at marriage here in that it's so unlike the thinking of the patriarchal world when it says, therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. That's not the way the patriarchal world does things. Women leave their families and cleave to their husbands. But this is a very interesting verse here. And they become one flesh. Now, the one flesh principle is something you could write a whole book of theology about. Paul deals with it, of course. He shows that it's much, in the intercourse of the man and the woman, it's much more than just a physical thing. It has great, great emotional dimensions. It has tremendous spiritual dimensions. And two become one. I don't know whether two unequal parts can become one. I doubt it. This may speak further to the fact that there's equality here. No inequality at all. But we don't have time to go into this tremendous, <laughs> great theme of, of the oneness of the flesh. And on top of that, somebody ought to write a book on nakedness in the Bible, because nakedness is much more than just taking off your clothes. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed, because sin hadn't come into the world yet. Now, before we get into chapter 3, and I was thinking that maybe we wouldn't have time to do it all tonight and have to continue next week, we ought to have some time for you to ask some questions and discuss here. And I don't have, by any stretch of the imagination, do I think that I have all the answers. I probably won't be able to answer your question, but what would you like to talk about for a little while? I have heard from several sources. Um, one that lives 
with a Hebrew word like uterus, and then another another man wrote too that possibly the two were in one, male and female, like there are some no, creatures like that's that. androgynous hermaphrodites. That's exactly what the, the Hebrew Bible won't allow. That's what happens in the in some places in the other part of the ancient world, the Greek world particularly, you have hermaphrodites or you have, what's the other term? Androgynous. Yeah, androgynous. In which you have andro, again, the word for male, and gune, the word for woman in Greek, uh, androgynous, in which you have the maleness and the females in the same person and then the gods split them in half or something. That is totally repulsive to the Hebrew mind and totally rejected here. So I don't think we even need to discuss that. <laughs> Not that I could discuss it anyway. My wife is better at discussing Greek myths. She's the classicist in the family. But do you see any e inequality here? I don't see it. I, I, uh, in this discussion, I guess I have uh, one question that keeps nagging. Welcome back. Well, sharing and serving each other willingly and lovingly as egalitarians is what produces healthy marriages and relationships. Listen to what Paul says we are to do if we are to be one in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 5, 20 to 21 says, Give thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another, the main reason for our creation as men and women is to be inheritors to, together of eternal life. This was made possible again because Jesus Christ gave his life for us so that we can repent of our sins, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as our mother God, cleanses us spiritually and teaches us the wonderful truths of God. Now, both Jesus and our Heavenly Father will come and live in us. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14, 16-17, 23 and 26. And I pray the Father, and he'll give you another comfort. Comfort is like a mother we have physically, that she may abide in you forever. <clears throat> Even the Holy Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it sees her not, neither knows her. But you know her, for she dwells in you and shall be in you. Jesus answered and said unto him, that is to Judas Iscariot in verse 22, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him and we will come into him and make our abode with him. Then down in verse 26, Jesus says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in the Old Testament her name was Ruach, which was a feminine name for the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Remember, God the Father has called both men and women to eternal inheritance as sons and daughters. The only way to receive that inheritance is through Jesus Christ. Um, he shed his life's blood for us. We are not to neglect this wonderful calling to Christ's egalitarian priesthood of all believers. Now is our time in this day and age to produce good works by the gifts of the Holy Spirit and listen to what the writer of the book of Hebrews says to us in Hebrews 2.3. How shall we escape if we neglect the greater salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Hebrews 9, 14, 24, and 28. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, not now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So long oh, until next time. Yeah.